Now we're ready to continue on in looking at some more rules governing probability. We're going to look at conditional probabilities and then look a little bit more at the general multiplication rule and how those two rules really affect each other. When we talked about the multiplication rule, we talked about situations where we have one event that's followed by a second event, such as the tossing of a coin, the rolling of a die. When you have one event followed by another, the one thing we want to ask ourselves is, are these events independent or dependent? If they're independent, then their individual occurrence does not affect the probability of the other. In other words, our first outcome won't affect the probability of the second outcome. We see this again with flipping of the coins, rolling of the die. Each event carries its own probability, and its outcome does not affect the probability of the, of the events that follow it. If we draw a card from a deck of cards, but then replace that card before our second drawing is made, we haven't changed the sample space, and therefore we haven't changed the probability based on the first occurrence. If two events are dependent, then the first outcome will change the probability of the second outcome. We see this if we're picking cards from a deck, picking marbles from a bag, what have you, and we're not replacing them as we go. Every time we remove a card from a deck or a marble from a bag, we have a smaller sample space, and therefore our probability is changing from event to event. We have fewer outcomes possible in the sample space, and hence a different probability. One thing we don't want to do is to try to is to confuse independence with disjointedness. These are really two different concepts. When we talk about independence of events, we're talking about uh, probability and whether one will affect the other. When we talk about disjointedness, we're talking about shared outcomes of single events. So in other words, one event occurs or one trial occurs, but there's multiple ways we can be successful. When we have a single trial, but multiple ways to be successful, we need to look as to whether those uh, two events have any shared outcomes. Whereas independence is really dealing with situations where we have one event followed by a second event, and we're concerned about whether the probability of the first affects the probability of the second. We cannot picture independence with the Venn diagram, though, as we've seen on the previous lessons, uh, we can picture uh, disjointedness with Venn diagrams. So let's look again at the general rule of probability. For every situation where we have one event followed by a second, and we want to know what's the probability of A occurring and then B occurring, we can find the product of the two, in the two events. We add this little caveat here uh, with our a straight up and down line. This means given. And so the way we read this is we're going to take the probability of A and we're going to multiply it by the probability of B, assuming that A has already occurred. If the two events are independent, then the fact that A has occurred does not change the probability of B. However, if they're dependent, then assuming that A has occurred, we uh, change the probability of B based on however uh, A has affected B. So this rule can be used for dependent as well as independent events because if the independent if the events are independent, the probability that B will the, B, the probability of B given that A has occurred does not affect B. And so probability of B is just equal to probability of B as if A never even occurred. And so therefore, uh, this can be used in every situation. If A does affect B, then of course, the probability of B will be affected by A, and so we change the probability based on that idea.
When we look at the general multiplication rule, it helps us clarify the meaning of dependent events. For the probability of B, given that A has occurred, we know that event A has occurred. Since A is a given then, it changes our range of possible outcomes. Therefore, it changes our sample space. We can see this in the formula, and more so, we'll be able to see it in the following example. So if you'll notice here, uh, when we take the probability of, a, of B, given that A has occurred, we have, we're only taking into consideration the uh, outcomes of A. And up here, we only take uh, the probability where A and B intersect with each other. Again, we can see this really in an example. If we're finding the probability that a given vehicle is a truck, well, we would find it using the general addition rule. In our table here, we have domestic cars broken down by, or we have cars broken down by domestic and imported, and we have vehicles broken down by trucks and cars. If we want to know the probability that if we pick a random vehicle, that it would be a truck, we take the sum of this box and this box. In other words, we're taking the sum that a car is a light truck and it's a domestic, and then we add it to the probability that it's a light truck and it's imported. The sum of those two probabilities give me 0.52, which of course is also equal to our total over here. Now let's change this up a little bit. If this was the probability that any uh, car we pick, or vehicle I should say, that we would pick would be a truck. But let's say ahead of time we know that we only want to take into account imported cars. So we say, uh, given that our vehicle is imported, how does that change our probability that we would pick a truck? This is the way we would write it in probability notation. This reads probability that we would pick a truck given that we already know it's imported. So now I've toned it down to just the imported column. These are the only vehicles that I'm considering. Now, of these vehicles, um, if we're looking at the probability that it's a truck, well, the trucks are only 8% of the imported vehicles, or 8% of the total um, vehicles in total. But when we take into account only imported, we're going to take the probability that it's truck and imported, because that's the only stuff we're considering is imported trucks. So you can see it's the intersection. We put the row in the column there. And then we're going to divide it by the new sample space, which is uh, the percent of the population that is made up of imports. So we divide it by the probability that it's imported. The ratio of these two, the mean of division, we get 35%. So there's a 35% probability that if we know ahead of time it's imported, that um, it would be a truck. In other words, 35% of the imported car vehicles are trucks. Let's look at a couple more examples here. What's the probability that a randomly chosen vehicle is imported given that it's a truck? So now we've switched uh, the places of those two um, variables. Now we're considering or assuming that whatever we pick, it's going to be a truck. So we're only taking trucks into consideration. That means this row right here. So as we look at this row, we want to look at where the imported trucks would be. And of course, they're in the same spot they were before. This is again the intersection of trucks and imported. So we have 8%, which only is of the total population, but since we're only taking truck, uh, trucks into consideration, we're going to divide it by however many trucks there are in the overall population. So in other words, we take the intersection of truck and import, find its probability, then divide it by the probability of trucks. The result is 8% over 52, which means there's a 15% probability that I, if I know it's a truck ahead of time, that it would be an imported truck. What's the probability that I would pick a car, then, given that I know it's a domestic? See if you can quickly use your calculator to come up with that decimal value. And 
this case, I'm only taking domestics into consideration. And of those domestics, uh, we see that the probability that it would be a truck is 44%. But that's 44% of the entire population. We only need to take into consideration the uh, probability that um, it's a domestic. And so if we divide 0.44, oh, I'm sorry, we've got some cars. <laughs> wrong numbers. Uh, probability it's a car given it's a domestic. We're going to look at domestic cars. I'm still stuck on trucks. Uh, so that would be 0.33 over 0.77. And that gives me about 42.85%. The probability that it would be a domestic if we already know it's a car, well that's the same intersection, it's domestic cars, but now we're assuming it's a car and so therefore we divide it by 0.48 and we get a 68.75%. <clears throat> Note that in the previous example, as in all tables, that the rows and the columns of the probability should always add up to one. If I go back to our picture here, we can see that for my totals, when we talk about trucks or cars, trucks made up 52% of the population and cars made up 48% of the population. We also broke it down by domestics and imported, and if we add up this row, it also comes out to 100%. This is important to keep in mind if we're only given partial information and we're asked to find more complicated probabilities. So here's an example of uh, a problem where there's really no context to these numbers, but we're just given a couple probabilities. We're first of all told that the probability of event A is 49%, and the probability of B is 26%. We're also told that the probability of A and B is 25%, meaning that the probability A and B occur uh, at the same time is uh, 25%. And here's our question. Find the probability that B will occur given not A. This can be really confusing if we don't help to organize our uh, information into a table. And so that's what we're going to do on this next thing. So here's our information again. And I'm going to make a table. And in this table, we're going to fill in the given probabilities that we have. Go ahead and draw this on a piece of paper, and we're going to fill this out together. <clears throat> now, unfortunately, um, I can't uh, fill this out for you, but I'm going to give you uh, some direction here. So, first of all, let's put in what we have. Probability of A. We're given that it's 49%. Probability of A is right here. And so, in the totals column for probability, we're going to put 0.49. We're also told that the probability of B is 26%. I put the B event on the top. And so the probability of B total is going to go down here to 26%. The other piece of information that we're not necessarily given, but we always know is the case that we saw previously, is that down here in this box, we should have a total of 1. Now, if I know that this number here is 26% and I know that it has to add up to 1, that tells me what this value is, uh, not B. If this is 26, then this has to be 74% in order for it to add up to 1. Also, in my totals column here, uh, we had 49%. That tells me that the probability of not A would be its complement, which is 0.51. Again, your total rows should always add up to 1. The, key other the other key piece of information we have here is the probability of A and B equaling 25%. This represents the intersection of these two boxes here. So I'm going to put 25% here. Now, since I know that this is 25%, and I know that the total down here was, uh, the total probability of B was 26, that means the probability of 
not A and B occurring is 0.01, 1%, because 25 plus 1 will give me 26. Also over here, I knew that this total was the total probability of A, which is 49. We have 25 here, and so that tells me this box must be 24%, which is what I would need to add up to 49. On and on we go, filling in the empty boxes. Eventually, we're left with this last one here, where we had 24%, and then at the very bottom, uh, we had 74. So we fill in the box with that missing information, and we have a completed table at this point. Now looking at your table, let's go ahead and figure out what um, our numbers would be to find the probability of B given that not A has occurred. First, we go to this, the intersection of probability B and not A. But B and not A was right here. The value in this box was 0 0.01, 1%. So 1% goes on top. And then we're given the probability of not A. Well, we found the probability of not A to be 51%. That was over here, of course. So 0.01 divided by 0.51 gives me 0 0.0196, or 1.96%. This concludes this portion of uh, the recording. As you're doing your problems, um, when you come across problems, especially when they involve not A, pause and fill out a table, kind of like we did here, to help you figure out what the individual probabilities are so you can find these more complicated conditional probabilities.